Thank you to Laurie Underwood for selecting my paper and giving me an opportunity to speak. My paper will talk a little bit about art as activism and how um, sometimes there's a questioning of what is art and what is activism and together there are certain times they're not coming together. And then uh, I'll take India as a case study and I'll talk about how NGOs are failing and why they're not able to work and the art is failing and we still have issues um, with women, uh, gender issues, a lot of transsexual issues um, and it still uh, keeps growing. So um, that's a thing. Okay, so um, art is the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination typically in a visual form such as painting or sculpture producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty and emotional, emotional power. Activism is the policy or action for using vigorous campaigning to bring about political and social change. Current discussions about art are very much centered on the question of art as activism, that is, on the ability of art to function as an arena or medium for political protest and social activism. The phenomenon of art and activism is central to our time because it is a new phenomenon, quite different from the phenomenon of critical art that became familiar to us during the recent decades. Art activists um, do not want to merely criticize the art system or the general political and social conditions under which the system functions. Rather, they want to change these conditions by means of art, not so much inside the art system, but outside it, in in reality itself. Art activists try to change the living conditions in economically underdeveloped areas, <coughs> raise ecological concerns, offer access to culture and education for the populations of poor countries and regions, attract attention to the plight of illegal immigrants, improve the conditions of people working in the art institutions and so forth. In other words, art activists react to the increasing collapse of the modern social state and try to replace the social state and the NGOs that are, for different reasons, cannot and fulfill their role. Art activists do not want to be use, do want to be, do want to be useful to change the world, to make the world a better place. But at the same time, they don't want to cease being artists. And this is the point where theor theoretical, political, and even purely practical problems arise. Art activism attempts to combine art and social action come under attack from both of these opposite perspectives, traditional artistic and traditional activist ones, both. Traditional artistic criticism operates according to the notion of artistic quality. From this point of view, art activism seems to be artistically not good enough. Many critics say that the morally good intentions of art activism substitute for artistic quality. This kind of criticism is usually easy to reject. In the 20th century, all the criteria of quality and taste were abolished by the different avant-garde, so today. It makes no sense to appeal them. However, criticism from other side is much more serious and demands an elaborate critical answer. This criticism mainly operates according to the notions of aesthetic aestheticization and specularity. And this means that art cannot control, cannot be used as a medium, as a genuine political protest, because the use, because the use of art as political action necessarily aestheticizes this action, turns this action into a spectacle, and thus neutralizes the <coughs> practical effect of this action. As an example, um, this is the work by um, artist Beric. Um, this was curated at Berlin Benile uh, by Arthur, uh, Arthur Zemdrisky and uh, the criticism was provoked, uh, described it as was by very different ideological sides of as a zoo of art activists. So uh, this, this, this work was, ev it was done in 1999 but it was removed from the Benile uh, just recently because it disrespected uh, the Holocaust um, victims and 
this is just one of the examples of why it was, uh, there was a lot of backlash over this. In other words, the art component of art activism is often seen as the main reason why acti activism fails on the pragmatic, lev prag pragmatic practical um, level, on the level of its Im immediate social and political impact. So um, I think uh, this was my, uh, probably the understanding of, uh, just to show a relationship of art and activism uh, going together. Um, but taking it in India, uh, art and activism has always existed in India in many formats. But when these two concepts come together, they don't work the way they should. They may influence change in society, but unfortunately, <coughs> the diverse thoughts are met with destruction and disrespect that are not starkly visible. India is modernizing as a country at a very fast pace. We have public Wi-Fi, we have metro trains, we have air-conditioned buses with auto-lock doors, <laughs> and we have good-looking airports. And we also have apps <laughs> that which you can use to call help as if, if women are being harassed by somebody. But the question arises, um, why make women's safety dependent on robotic technology? Should we not teaching our men to respect women? Um, and before, I just wanted to pause on this. I've, uh, this is a very interesting article. Um, I can share this link uh, if, if you need. But there's 72% of women in India um, have these safety apps. My sister is one of them. And 95 of them have faced street harassment. And by street harassment, if you're walking down the street in India, any part of the street, um, you're bound to get touched at least 10 to 15 times. So you can imagine the, the 10 to 15 times you're expected to use the app. So where is, how is that a solution? So that was just uh, one of my points. And I found this really <laughs> wonderful quote that I'm going to talk. Um, we all need a technological detox. We need to throw away our phones and computers instead of using them as a pseudo defense system for anything that comes our way. We need to be bored and we have and not have anything to use to shield the boardroom away from us. We need to be lonely and see what it is we really feel when we are. If we continue to distract ourselves so we never have to face the realities in front of us, when the time comes, you are faced with something bigger that, that your phone, food, and friends can't fix, uh, you will be in big trouble. Um, another one, another two of my favorite quotes. Um, old robots are becoming more like humans and hu young humans are becoming more like robots. And of course, uh, George Bernard Shaw's uh, progress is impossible without change and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. So like most Western countries, socially, politically and economically, India portrays a successful Indian woman as one who's educated, independent, urban and equal to men. The harsh reality is that while Indian women have made significant inroad uh, into the areas that are male dominated, whether at home or work, they are largely, largely still marginalized. Social evils such as dowry and domestic violence still exist. Women are still subjected to physical and mental torture by male members in their life. It has nothing to do with rich or poor. Women are being scrutinized and victimized regardless of their age, financial ability, caste, or whatever background they come from. So um, before I move on further with my paper, um, I want to talk about um, how art is failing to make a difference in the lives of Indian women especially. And I want to talk about Samath. Uh, and art, any study of art and activism in India is incomplete without talking about Samath. It is an acronym, acronym for the Safdar Hashmi Memorial Trust and the Hindi word for in, in agreement. On 1st January 1989, <coughs> Safdar Hashmi was fatally attacked in broad daylight while performing a street play in Sahidabad, a working class area just outside Delhi. Political activist, actor, playwright and poet, 
Savdar had been deeply committed, like so many young men and women in his generation, to the anti-imperialist, secular, secular egalitarian values that are woven into the rich fabric of nation's liberal liberation struggle. The spontaneous anger generated by Safzar Hashmi's murder grew into a resolve to resist the forces threatening the essentially pluralist and democratic spirit of creative expression. Writers, painters, scholars, poets, architects, photographers, designers, cultural activists, and media persons formed the Safzar Hashmi Memorial Trust. Within the weeks of his death, um, from its inception, it has been a platform with a shared perspective and has welcomed distinctive creative crea creativities of those who have been part of its activities. Interested in their work, I researched more um, more about the group and the works that this trust has produced. The latest work that I saw was a group of. Uh, beautiful conceptual exhibitions by the Indian artists. However, the exhibition was being held in Chicago and not in India. This is a proof enough that the art and activism aren't coming together in India as it should. The concepts of street plays, graffiti on the wall, reaching out to community one-on-one -on -one basis, initiatives started by local NGOs are still struggling to, today to make that real change. These local NGOs lack strong financial abilities to survive, and the ones that are able to survive are actually being supported by bigger organizations uh, outside India. The reason why I highlighted Samad and the issues about local NGOs is uh, because the ability, because they have the ability and the power to change the society, yet local communities do not support them financially enough to survive and thrive. As per a 2009 survey, there are about 2 million NGOs in India, which estimates to just over one NGO per 600 people. In a densely populated country like India, with the nature of resources at disposal, disposal if used appropriately, just over one NGO per 600 people is a good number. With the number of activist groups and organizations existing in the country, it is important to raise the question of why then have India's <coughs> social and welfare problems continued to be the very same, the only, with the only change in the number in which they manifest themselves. Take an example of Child Labor Prohibition Act um, of 2016. Its provisions are not based on the understanding of why children um, having to work or choosing work instead of pursuing education? Is it because their family needs extra support? The lack of access or irrelevance of the education being provided? Rather, it is based on merely of the opinion that children should not work. Agreed, children should not work. But in order to address that, it becomes imperative to first investigate why children have to work. Working children are not the are not the problem. It is the reason why they are working and the lack of social welfare and security that the problems are. Second is the problem of looking at ma matters in isolation. All developmental changes have social, economic, cultural, political and ecological aspects. The growth is sporadic and directionless in nature and is ge geographically limited. The social uh, cannot be addressed in isolation of the economic cultural, political, or ecological, geographical, and vice versa. They all are in factor and intersect at same point. The third problem is taking a political stance. Issues related to social justice, welfare, by the very nature, are political, and, and a political approach towards them is bound to fail. Issues of gender, for instance, cannot be addressed apolitically because at the heart of the issue lies the politics of body, discrimination, patriarchy, and semantics. My second part of the uh, presentation is about the advertising that's being displayed in India. Whether the advertising shown in TV commercials, billboards on the streets, newspapers, or magazines, or in any other Bollywood entertainment, Bollywood movies that we see, I'm considering that as part of the advertisement as well. Uh, there is a lot of art and <coughs> activism there's not a lot of art and activism in these forms of communication. With 85% of literacy rate in Kerala, 
um, the southernmost state in India. It's actually uh, the only state that has the uh, maximum literacy rate. Conventional methods of marriages are still very common. Intercaste and inter-religion marriages are still frowned upon. Women are chastised for sexual relationships prior to marriage. It is not common to see a movie poster with no women shown in them. They slap the face of the hero three to four times in the same poster as a women's role in movie needs no visual representation in the graphics. The fight between gender roles can't be seen in Indian culture and society through can be seen in Indian culture and society through various TV advertisements. And I want to explain this with an example of Kellogg's advertisement created for India. Um, it is the same company, same product, but the ads are shown in US and are very different from what is just shown in India. Um, don't have the video with me, but I took screen grabs. So on the screen, these are the screenshots of Kellogg's ads that we see in US. The women are shown working in an office, running marathons, taking care of family, doing karate lessons, and so many roles without the presence of a dominating male. And actually, there is no, probably just on that screen, but other than most of them, they're just shown women. As opposed to the ads shown in India, these are the Indian ads, same product, same Kellogg's, everything, same. Where the wife's purpose is to please the husband in bed, and that's why she should eat Kellogg's to keep herself in shape. Okay, there's nothing wrong <laughs> in keeping yourself <laughs> in best shape possible. I'm not against that. But does that define the role of women gender? And that's what I question. Um, I, I just turn my TV off when these ads are coming, and I tell my mom, like, I don't want to see Indian TV. That's one thing I don't want to see is Indian TV. Um, and there are many ads like these. I mean, this is just one of the samples that I've, but if you go on, they're like crazy, crazy ads. You just want to fire up the TV. Okay. The reason why I'm discussing the advertisements is because that's one medium where people are able to relate to their culture faster, which is why we need <coughs> ad busters and culture jamming. <coughs> ad busters describes itself as anti-advertising. It blames advertising for playing a central role in creating and maintaining consumer culture. Culture jamming is a primary means through which ad buster challenges consumerism. This argument is based on the belief that the advertising industry goes to great effort and expense to associate desire and identity with com commodities. Adbusters believes that advertising has unjustly colonized public, uh, discursive and psychic spaces by appearing in movies, sports and even schools as to premiate modern culture. Adbusters stated goals include combating the negative eff effects of advertising and empowering its readers to regain control of culture, encouraging them and ask, are we consumers or citizens? Unfortunately, this problem is generational. It begins with the depiction of women in visual history as a person waiting for a husband to come home from the war or from any other administrative or government work. From paintings all the way from 1500s, we clearly see how gender roles are still being followed. The difference is the manifestation of its presentation. So this is one uh, woman, man, in a moment of sexual intimacy. Um, and this is in the modern era of communication in movies and posters where women dependencies are also glorified and greatly appreciated. Here, women is seen as uh, entertaining the emperor and this is where Sunny Leon simply cannot step up beyond such roles. This one seen here is emperor ready to go to war. And this is the new concept of visual representation of how it may look when you go on war. The point that I'm trying to make is that art and activism in India needs tremendous strategic thinking before it is executed. We are living in a world with multiple mindsets, different thinking concepts, and with huge um, generation gap, we will continue to have such differences. By creating more and more NGOs, simply posting videos on Twitter with, which is sporadic in nature and unorganized, we will not affect these big million dollar industries that feed us through such visuals in our everyday lives. Art and activism as it exists in India has to go beyond the art galleries. 
Street theatre as a form of communication is deeply <coughs> rooted in Indian tradition and probably the way to go towards expanding it. Partnering with NGOs is another way and just wanted to bring, uh, talk about Thalia Art Foundation is one of them which is uh, working uh, very vigorously with, um, in, in India and having these artists come and make a difference and do workshops and presentations and things like that in India especially. Okay. Um, this comment is coming from uh, Deborah Dane, the article that I shared before. Um, she makes a great point as to why things don't work in India. As campaigners, we often know the button to press to get short-term wins. Usually this involves anger, using words such as stop this or save that. We put up pictures of an evil politician or evil corporate bosses and expect to inspire change. Even I, a seasoned campaigner, turned off. But imagine, for a moment, what, if, what, what it feels like when someone argues with you. Your tendency is to be defensive or think this off. It's not often that someone wants to engage in a progressive change agenda while staring down the barrel of a gun. Campaigners need to find ways to engage either directly or ind indirectly while maintaining their values. This isn't to be confused within the empty stakeholder dialogues of recent years, but long-term change won't happen solely through the protest with, and with only half of the audience in the room. This applies to both sides. Can businesses, for example, let activists in the room without manipulating them? Are they prepared to listen? I don't think campaigns should cease. The open doors, the open doors, they, they can get people thinking. But unless campaigning is coupled with approaches that are deeper, then we'll be keep fighting, then we'll be keep fighting the same old battles until we're pulling um, up the sandbags to hold back the floods, and then it will be too late to do anything about it. Does anyone have any uh, questions or comments? Um, how do you think, I'm always thinking about an intersectional approach, so how do you think also like colorism plays into it? Hmm. I know that that's a huge thing that <coughs> impacts like, the black community. So um, when you spoke about Beyonce, meaning a fair skin woman of color, that sort of thing, do you think that's a, a big issue? It's a very big issue. I'm, I'm supposed to be a very dark person, according to an Indian, uh, a, a North Indian uh, realm of women. My sisters are, they're almost like as white. They're like, yeah, absolutely white. So um, women do face, and there are lots of advertisements. If you Google fair and lovely, mm -hmm. they are very known for making very racist and very um, bias ads and uh, they still do uh, but sometimes uh, you, you, will s you, you have seen shift uh, because there's a lot of talk about the kind of advertisements they do and the billboards that you'll see and you're getting married because now you have a fair skin so now you have a very lovely husband and a rich husband and you'll get a better life uh, because you have your fair skin mm. and um, and I know like a lot of a lot of talk here like there's a lot of blame on white people white people and I'm like you have no idea how racist Indians can be you know they are very racist towards dark people as well within their own community like if you go further down south uh, the people are much darker in their skin and they are uh, they're they, they don't appreciate it they're not appreciated so um, it's not just uh, I think it's just the fairness is being is being seen as a solution being glorified as mm -hmm. something that's gonna make your life better you know do you think that the fairness system is some form of purity yes it is even in in our in our goddesses like mm -hmm. um if you see how durga is, is painted it's light yellow color bright bright colors and it is seen as purity lakshmi uh, all these gods they have swans and things like that, white as purity in certain, uh, certain religion. So you do see a lot of cross, 
yeah. Even in the paintings, all these uh, Mughal time paintings, and you, you won't see uh, a darker shade hmm. in the paintings at all, in the skin color. You would see it, I mean, I wish I could do that study. It's like a whole another study to do it, but um, there are a lot of painting, you, you would see them as servants, yeah. and they're darkened in their tone, and you will see that difference of the tone in their, in their work. Isn't that, uh, sorry, uh, but also I, I know that at least in some forms of uh, tantric inspired art, you do have darker, but again, that's part of the whole art. Yeah. So maybe you fetishize it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like a whole another study to, oh, yeah. <laughs> to find. And then with regards to um, Indian men, Mm -hmm. Do they follow the same? Yeah, Fair and Lovely actually did do that ad. They, they have done ads where they've shown a guy wants to be fairer. And they have done that. Um, I, I wish I could show in my YouTube. And I'm sure you'll find it in YouTube if you search Fair and Lovely ads. And they, I remember there was an ad where a guy was conscious about his skin color. And, he, and there is a fair and lovely men version and a fair and lovely woman <laughs> cream version. So... <sighs> yeah, <laughs> it's out there. Did you have a uh, Yeah, I think maybe you kind of answered that, but I just wanted to say um, <coughs> that colonialism enhanced that or began to get into the pre-colonial things as well, but I was wondering if the colonial period it did. British was all, like my, my grandfather, he was actually fairer than even I am. I, I take the color from my father, so I'm a little wheatish. But my father, uh, my grandfather, he was really, really white, very, uh, he had a very fair skin. And he worked with Britishers. He all, only worked with, so he had that superiority in him that I'm working with white folks or I'm working with, uh, with British people. It, it's an achievement for him. You know, so he he did carry that uh, that understanding that being white or me as a third child, I'm dark skinned, according to the other sisters. So he did feel like, oh, I wish you were fairer, hmm. like them. You know, so it did it did inherit uh, in the in the system. It does come, um, and I'm sure it's uh, it's not just my family, but it's it's. It's Where everywhere. Did you begin here? How many white people trying to get attached? They had to spend their entire lives in the sun trying to darken themselves. <laughs> it just seems to be such a peculiar anomaly. The sun tanning? The, the tanning? Yeah, you will not find a lot of. It's, it's, fu it's funny, you will not find a lot of tanning uh, parlors in India. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to. You spend 20 minutes outside in the sun and you're good to go. You don't have to spend $200. <laughs> but I, I'm of Italian descent, so in Ireland, mm -hmm. where I come from, I, I was like, I, I, people are permanently going, oh, look at your skin, it's a beautiful, it's so dark. Because in yeah. Ireland, people are, 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 are pale skin mm -hmm. and, and like red hair. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the, uh, that's the, lighter, yeah, lighter yeah to exactly. And there's, there's so many dark. South Indians, they don't like to go in the sun because mm. they're like, I'm going to get darker <laughs> because of it. I don't want to, yeah. So. Beaches in Spain, like, like toasted sandwiches. I, I feel yeah. like, I feel like everybody thinks the other side is always greener and oh, you nice. always, always feel like it's going to be better for them, something different for them. Straight hair, you curly hair, oh, I did it! <laughs> I yeah. curled my hair because I'm so tired of straight hair. I have a naturally straight hair, and I always curl because I, yeah. Quick context on that: I do find, like, I've had this conversation before, and uh, my, par my parents are of Jamaican descent, so they, so we suffer. Our community suffers a lot from colorism as well. Mm -hmm. And in the Jamaican community, it's dark means you work outside. Right, so you right. don't have a place, you just office job. Mm -hmm. you're, you're and I find when, when you flip that, darker skin or tan skin means you have the luxury of not having to work. Mm -hmm. So it's all about class systems. 
any yeah. kind of interest had to yeah. it that way. But I, do, I always find that hilarious. <laughs> you can have some wine. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's always like everyone wants what they don't have. You know? I, I'm very fascinated by, by curly hair. Because I don't have straight, so I find curly hair, and everybody's like, my sister has curly hair. It's like I hate curls. I want straight hair. But nobody it's like, wants what they yeah, have. I, I feel like, yeah, but exactly. There'd be no research if we thought that was the answer. <laughs> nobody wants what they have. End of academia. That's, that, that's true. Um, yeah. I, I had a, uh, just something to put out there, and I don't know whether this is gonna um, be something other people want to comment about, but. Um, in your uh, presentation, I was uh, thinking about because you, you focus a lot on advertisements, which mm -hmm. I thought was really interesting. What do would we uh, think of if we looked at advertising as a, essentially the dominant form of public art that we have uh, these days? Yeah, absolutely, and that's what um, Doordarshan back in when I was growing up in the '90s and. Um, I wanted to show that, but I couldn't uh, do it with the time and everything. But there are certain ads that Doordarshan at that time uh, were showing, based for u talking about unit unity and diversity, because there's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, difference. Like I said, from North and in North India and South India, they're like, "Oh, you're dark skinned They make fun of your accent. They like a lot of North Indians do that. So I would say. North Indians are more like white people, <coughs> South Indians are more like black people, and I mean that's how I would uh, try to explain. But, um, and they would make ads of unity and diversity and things like that, but you don't see these ads anymore. And those ads used to come from government, those ads used to come from uh, a very capitalist government, I must say, not a very socialist government. We now have a, a mix of socialists, Narendra Modi. It, he's a bit of a capitalist, but uh, but he like it's it's a it's a it's a mix of a lot of things, which is why it's kind of directionless, and you don't know where he's going. But um, back in that time, it was Congress and BJP uh, ma mainly that they were coming up, and um, the these ads that came directly from the government, and it was a public. Uh, it w there were ads about save water. There were mm -hmm. ads about unity in the songs and there were ads about um, uh, a very cartoonish uh, uh, style that they had just to explain what unity means to mm. a very person who doesn't even know how to write his name. How would you explain him unity? You know, how would you explain him that community matters? It was such basic ads. They're all up there on the YouTube. If, if, if I, I can always share the links to to such things. Uh, okay. those, but they have stopped. From they the, have. From the so oh yeah. They came from NGOs. They came oh. from um, NCERT, forgetting national education something something that was the term, and um, it was all uh, coming from from the NGOs. Yeah. Like, why is this happening? Because we hear about the, the child's brides, for right. example. Why is that happening in India? Why are the men, like good men, like your father or your uncles, are not protecting their daughters or their wives? Or their, how is that able to happen? How, do you, how is it that you can be walking down the street and you can be getting touched? Yeah. So. Well, my father has kicked a lot of people's asses, <laughs> and um, I I remember uh, he I bought my first camera in um, in a very in a in a black market that we say in India where you buy everything in cash and it all comes from sneaking in from Thailand and all these uh, places. So the camera was camera was bought like that, and I remember my father was walking and I was walking right behind him. M like I was literally this close because I didn't want anyone to touch me. Mm. And uh, he was literally walking like a guard. And he's like, you are not going to that place all by yourself. I have to go with you. So, um, but that's the thing. I managed to agree to him, but a lot of women are like, no, I'm going to do things on my own. I don't need my father. I don't need my brother every time. And then you're in trouble. Then you don't know what to do when somebody touches you, you know? So, and so it's almost, I suppose, if you're a woman on your own or you don't have a male in your presence. It makes a difference. It's a huge difference. It, it makes a huge, huge difference. 
Um, you have to have, um, I tell my father, like, you have to come with me. I'm not going to that place all by myself. Or when we go to any of our government uh, work, let's say we have our property papers or something that has to be signed, you go to a, a government-based office, those offices are really nasty places. So my dad is like, I have to go with you. There's, I, I cannot do, and my father is very old. So we're always like, oh, it's going to be so hot. There's no AC. It's, it, you know, you're, you're diabetic and your sugar is going to go down. And he's like, my daughter is not going to that place all by herself. But is it just that there's a very low value on women? Like, is that where this is coming I just, from? I just feel like if they just, I don't know how to explain this in words, but if I'm, if I'm here and if I'm standing, I'll just go walk like this. And, I, and for them, it's pleasure. You know, and they literally see that and learn it from Bollywood movies. They see oh, it from these okay. silly advertisements and movies where they're fancy to touch a woman and she'll be like, oh, I, I got touched, oh, I got loved. And they, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, if you see all these serials and ads that are coming on television, they're just awful and they glorify such things. But, but those kind of values they're perpetuated somewhere. They're, they're perpetuated in schools and they're perpetuated in, in organizations and in governments. Mm -hmm. And they're perpetuated somewhere because lots of, you know, lots of boys or girls watch porn and, mm -hmm. watch, and, and don't go and rape people or mm -hmm. touch up people on buses or, and some do. Yeah. But by, by and large, I can walk down the street in Dublin and nobody will touch me. I get a wolf whistle and I've heard massive problems with women. Like there's been massive debate around the wolf whistle mm -hmm. idea, and um, you know it's very mild. Yeah. <laughs> you do you just blows a whistle at you compared to what you're talking about. So to me, the question mark there is to do with the social value system that's being mm -hmm. learned. I don't think that just boys are watching advertisements and saying, "Ah, oh, great, we have a, we have a few gropes." It has to be coming from the top somewhere that that's actually okay <coughs> for you to do that to a woman. Do you know what, as I say, I just think the structure and the value around women in that case must be, must be different. I think, I think in India, it's definitely primarily coming from TV. All you have to do is just spend three to four hours watching TV and watch the serials, the television ads, the news, and uh, just spend some time looking at what is being fed to these people. And these people are not the ones who are sitting with books. They're not the ones who are sitting with... But the advertisements with are made by the people of the society that they're in, like you're saying. Yeah, I'm trying to say... Oh, yeah, 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 of course. So they are reflective. coming from big so corporations. It's yes. Society. It's reflective of society. Right. Yes. yes. Certainly, it's, it's exaggerated, yeah. just like ads here in this yeah. country yeah. are exaggerated, mm -hmm. you know. But it's coming from the society. It's not coming from, the oh, ads. I see it on TV and then I'm going to do it. Yeah. The TV is reflecting what's happening in society. Yeah. 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 And it's about a value system that's huge in yeah. that case. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's a circle, just a going around. Of course, not to undermine, there probably are a lot of differences, but the West isn't immune to that. So oh, absolutely so not. There was, there was a, yeah. uh, a very famous. Uh, it, it, the video went on viral and this girl was wearing, she's wearing a t-shirt, uh, a simple t-shirt, I think her, her sleeves are like half sleeves, white t-shirt and a jeans and she's, she, got a ca she got another guy to take a camera from his back and she, and they showed how, sh how she's being teased in Manhattan, in streets of New York and just walking and she's walking, nothing with bag or anything and how people are reacting to her. So. In that video, nobody touches her, though. She gets comments and things like that. But in India, it's a step up, you know? I it's worse. There are probably communities and spaces, even in like Western contexts, where there is that sort of pervasive touching. So it was just a not so terrible to let Because I think the similar things are happening in terms of devaluation um, mm -hmm. and through advertising and things like that that do make it OK to mm -hmm. see women as sort of property here. That's interesting. I, fit, I was just thinking about the, uh, the your, your comparison with the Kellogg's ads. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel that's the same international corporation. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Everything is it. Yeah. In with one sort of general cultural thing, it's perhaps not necessarily you know, um, denigrating women. 
per yeah. se, so as long as they buy the product. Yeah. But in the other, in the one that you showed in India, it's pretty clear that yeah. uh, there was a, a, a very high sexist yeah. Yeah. message in mm -hmm. there as well. Mm -hmm. It's the same, uh, the same uh, corporation. Exactly. Itself exactly. No. Their ads in UK are also very different. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was just wondering if, if any of the citizens have kind of like used their consumer power to say like we're not going to contribute to these companies or, you know, like have anybody, like has anybody stepped out and said like we're not accepting this as... Yeah, I, I, was just curious I personally I still eat Kellogg's. <laughs> 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 I just had that in my hotel breakfast, but... Um, <laughs> um, I honestly have not seen that. I, um, the kind of uh, uh, the product ban that went was when it goes when it's more of a health issue. Mm -hmm. I have seen that, but not so much as an activist saying women stop eating Kellogg's because you are being objectified yeah. as something who just wants to play around and you know be in the bed and that's that's your purpose. You know, that's your purpose that your husband is talking for you. So I haven't seen that. And that's a good thing to kind of uh, research a little more on it, if, if, if they are. But um, in India, it's always the health issue. Mm -hmm. Something like, uh, like Maggie, uh, was, it's a very fattening uh, product. And a lot of people eat it. And uh, it, it was banned completely from India when it got into news about its contamination and health issues with it and it immediately stopped and the market stopped selling and stuff but if it's about a women issue I don't think so people will care hmm. I don't I don't think so I wonder and this is just something I'm uh, just, uh, thinking about when, uh, listening to you, uh, if, if some of the ripple effects of, of things like Me Too might be uh, over time having some effects because in one of my uh, Classes went with a um, students doing very interesting research about Me Too, and mm -hmm. it's actually starting to have some very interesting global effects mm -hmm. in areas outside of mm -hmm. the so-called West in a way that is, um, frankly, amazing. And yeah. I wonder if that might. Uh, yeah, I am actually signed up for um, a newsletter that's being posted by uh, just a group of women uh, about feminism in India, mm -hmm. and they do relate a lot to. They have done Me Too, and they do a lot of. They don't do much of campaigning, they don't do research, but they just do email blasts and mm -hmm. things like that, uh, to posting on Twitter and stuff. Right. But any, anything is good, yeah. I feel. I, I, but mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Fascinating All stuff. Right. Oh, okay. no, I just, I've been doing some research on the Me Too movement, and uh -huh. it, it has been going global, but in, in some areas, I think maybe like I, I'm thinking of Egypt and whatnot, they're getting big time backlash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to the women who are coming out. With right, I knew that there were some places like yeah. in Pakistan too was having yeah, some issues, exactly. and so. Uh, but and but they are at least having to deal with it, as you're saying. So. Yeah. There's some change that are being made. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see how it all works out. Of course, I mean, social media is art, right? That's well. Um, it is, it is a medium, it's a type of art, but I wouldn't say how it's used, it also depends on how it's used, you know, how, how, and how it's perceived and how it's response. And then Twitter is like tweeting and tweeting and tweeting. If you want to make things viral, then that is where to make it, I guess. But yeah. Very good. Thank you.